Hello, I'm Councillor Tudor Evans. I'm leader of Plymouth City Council, and I'm going to be answering your questions today on life in Plymouth after lockdown. How are we going to continue to support people who live, work and study in Plymouth with the problems they face, uh, especially some of the economic hardship that people have encountered due to COVID? The council's role in the city is to support its residents, whether we're in COVID or not, and we'll continue to do that. For example, last week, we made 2,311 business grant payments, totaling 5.238 million. Now, this means that since the beginning of the pandemic, we processed 15,825 payments, totaling nearly 75 million. This has helped to keep businesses afloat that might otherwise have gone to the wall. And our performance in this is, is better than a lot of local authorities around the country, in fact. You don't have to believe me, we, uh, Chamber of Commerce, Federation of Small Business say so. And we've got an amazing programme we call Resurgum, which is our economic reset project involving 11 different sectors of the economy, which is going great. Mike asks, now that Plymouth will become a free port, surely there's an argument for reopening the airport in the future to help attract businesses who want to invest in Freeport Plymouth. Um, If it's closed for good and used for housing, we might regret it, like when we lost much of our railway network. We are committed to bringing aviation back to Plymouth after the airport was shut. Don't forget, and a lot of people don't know this, but it was actually shut by a Conservative-led council at the time in 2011. Now, we've protected the site in the joint local plan for aviation use. That's what it says. And I've regularly made the case to government to support the reintroduction of aviation into the city. I recently wrote to the city's three MPs, asking them to make the case, the government, on the merits of supporting the reintroduction of aviation. We've successfully bid for consultancy advice from the Airfield Development Advisory Fund. So we've had that grant. That fund is there to help councils uh, get advice on costs associated with bringing the airport back into use. We are currently got a a bunch of aviation experts um, doing a survey and a study for us in that very respect. But, um, you know, the free port isn't, um, isn't just reliant on one mode of transport. I mean, the if you think about what we're actually trying to do here, we're basing our free zone at Ocean's Gate, which is our um, marine uh, enterprise zone down in South Yard, and also two sites next to the A38 at Langage and at Sherford. Um, so these sort of uh, connections are really important, water and the road network. And of course, we've been working really hard to upgrade the rail network and to make sure that uh, we have a safe, a fast and secure route uh, out of Plymouth to uh, London and to the Midlands. Uh, the Freeport, I'm really excited about. We've got the opportunity to make the rules here in a way that is different to other Freeport propositions. We're not going to be a container port like Liverpool or Hull. Never are going to be doing that, nor nor do we want to be. What we want to do is build on success. So that's why our partners in this venture include Babcock and Princess Yachts, who are two of our largest employers, um, because they, like us, are interested in using this to retain and develop skills in the local economy to make their businesses go better and also to realise more of Plymouth's potential. John asks, how will the council boost Plymouth's cultural scene to infuse people to join in after lockdown and also make up for missed opportunities like Mayflower 400? We've all been missing things, haven't we? I mean, we've been missing family and hugs and and all of that, but we've also been missing going to the pub with our mates or going to see a band or going to the pictures or going to the theatre or going to see a painting. So, you know, it's important um, that the culture strategy we launched uh, in the last few days is setting a course for us to develop more of that in the next 10 years. What makes a city vibrant is a, is a cultural offer, really. I mean, we said that 30 odd years ago when we built Theatre Royal, and some people thought we were nuts at the time to do it. But look at it now, one of the best regional producing theatres in the whole of the UK. So the culture strategy is going to be important. And we're, you know, things are really important to us. Um, like I say, can't wait for theatres to open again. But, I mean, don't forget, we have got uh, a lot on this summer. Um, The Mayflower 400 uh, Four Nations Ceremony on the 11th of July, for example, this will be our 
uh, flagship Mayflower 400 event. Um, that's going to mark the, the closure of the commemorations. We then got the SOGP, which is the world's fastest ra- uh, sailing race. We're having that in Plymouth Sound. And then we got the Hatchlin uh, on the 14th and 15th of August. A giant puppet in the form of a dragon will appear in Plymouth and roam through the city, exploring its new surroundings and uh, interacting with the public before taking flight across the sound in a -a once-in-a-lifetime spectacle. We're bringing back the British Fireworks Championship. And, of course, we're having the Ocean City Blues and Jazz Festivals coming back, the Sea Festivals coming, the Seafood Festival coming back, the Half Marathon will run again. Um, and we've got a whole host of community events from Pride to Mega Ride to the Circus. So it's all going on. We're really excited about the role that culture will play. And the box is reopening. You know, we spent uh, a lot of money on the box, but it's brilliant. It's a love letter to the people of Plymouth. It's got fantastic art in there, fantastic culture. And, um, you know, that, again, will be a fantastic thing to see back open again. A recent study carried out by the charity Young Minds stated that the pandemic has had Mm -hmm. a devastating impact on many of the young people we heard from. They also found that 67% of respondents believe that the pandemic will have a long-term negative effect on their mental health. The findings from this study have also been echoed in similar studies with young people. For example, the most recent Prince's Trust Happiness and Confidence Survey produced the worst findings in its history. My question is, Do you recognise that there is a serious storm brewing with this issue with our young people and that any more cuts to our services for young people will have a truly detrimental effect? And what do you see as the answer to this problem, considering over 75% of youth services have already been cut nationwide in recent years, including in Plymouth? Yeah, we're worried about our young people too. Um, You know, who knows what effect the pandemic is having. Um, We are currently planning for the reopening of physical core services in our youth services. We're recruiting new team members and enlisting support of other organisations and voluntary groups to ensure that we meet our young people's needs. We're working with a voluntary sector to roll out a pilot citywide survey based on the Children's Society's The Good Childhood Index. And this prioritises aspects of life or wellbeing identified as most important by children and young people. The findings will give an overview of young people's happiness and seek to bridge gaps in provision. It means the information we need for funding bids and where to target resources. During the pandemic, we didn't lose contact with our young people. We shifted to online delivery, uh, detached youth work and home delivery of activities. Any young person identified as vulnerable was invited into one-to-one sessions for support. With a big move towards more online shopping and fewer people using the high street, are there any plans to completely rethink or redesign the city centre? We've got millions of pounds um, already being invested in the city centre right now because, you know, we've been looking at this for a few years before the pandemic, to be honest, because we could see the writing on the wall, you know, for traditional shopping. It uh, it was on the decline. And what the city centre, I mean, people forget this, but up until 1991, Uh, Plymouth did not allow anything other than shops and banks into the city centre. Um, There weren't any restaurants, there weren't any bars, there weren't any hotels, there weren't any variety in there at all. And of course, that has shifted over the last 30 years. So if you look, we have our future high street project to restore and reinvent the civic centre, for example, and the Guildhall. And that's going to get more people city centre for live events, conferences, as well as shopping, eating and drinking. You can come into the box, spend two, three, four hours there, then go into the city centre and spend your hard-earned cash. And that's why we wanted to see the barcode open as well. You know, that's a cinema. And you go to the cinema, you can go shopping, you can go and have something to eat and drink. And it's that kind of variety as a destination for people, not just for shopping, but for a load of other things. Um, and the uh, bringing in of hotels, the conversion of the old Woolies building into uh, the OYO, and also uh, the conversion of the co-op into apartments and another hotel, drives footfall into the city centre. Don't forget, we made a wonderful £5 million upgrade of the uh, covered market, the Pannier market as well, a couple of years ago, looking still brilliant. And th- so there are those 
serious changes we've been making down the West End as well. And don't forget, you know, you've got Drake Circus. It's got, you know, shops like Hugo Boss and Apple in there. I mean, you know, cities our size don't normally get those. So it's brilliant that we have. But down the West End, we've taken the bridge away. And Frankfurt Gate is already looking brighter and area than. And, and when the time comes, we want people to be there sitting outside and enjoying some of the best independent food down there. Um, it's, it's great. The, the, the whole place now is, is having a lift. The West End is buzzing. Joseph asked the next question. He says, will there be a push on sport and leisure once lockdown eases to help us get fit and active? There's a multi-million pound refurbishment going on right now in the Life Centre. When people go back, they will recognise the Life Centre, but they'll also recognise some amazing um, changes that we've made um, to make it look and feel um, more modern. Um, Because, look, we know that being physically active is really good for your your physical health, obviously, but also for your mental health. And we know that, you know, people have really missed playing team sports, particularly going inside and and, and going to the gym or, or whatever it is. The opening up of sports facilities will really help people get back to fitness in, in mind and in body. Um, I wanted to mention the Life Centre in terms of the other facilities that we got, because um, one of the things it's going to have is a new studio that can be used for yoga, Pilates um, and such, because... Um, the, the demand for these kind of activities has soared in recent years. The sports development unit that we've got is really quite special. Uh, they support clubs, and I've been doing this throughout the pandemic, by the way, um, with, uh, you know, uh, funding advice and all sorts, uh, encouraging communities to be more active. They promote and coordinate opportunities, initiatives and activities on an ongoing basis, and are keen to support and encourage people back to sport and help the sector as a whole bounce back as and when restrictions allow. Oh, oh and by the way, um, um, we decided to open Tinside and Mount Wise pools a month earlier than usual. So from the 1st of May, you'll be able to go and use those. What's going to happen about water safety after lockdown? More and more people are using the water during this time um, for mental health and well-being and getting out and about. So we've seen a massive growth. It's only going to increase. What else are we going to do about water safety? My heart goes out to people who do wild swimming at this time of year, actually, I mean, particularly the winter swimmers. Um, but, you know, if you take precautions and you follow the advice, it's 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 um, safe. Um so we're going to be bringing back the pontoons at Tinside. Um, I'm really excited about that, two of them in, in that area that they used to be. And so many Plymouthians learned using those pontoons how to swim safely and, and, and learned, maybe took their first steps in, in a kayak or a, or a canoe there. Um, we're going to be putting loads of new safety signs up around the waterfront as well, reflecting this increased um, uh, demand on the water and the need for people to take care and be water aware. Um, we're also going to make a huge investment at Mountbatten um, um, in the uh, in the water sports centre there, probably going to change the name of it to the Plymouth uh, Water Sports Centre, um, and make a huge investment there to try and get more and more uh, Plymouthians on the water again. Um, I mean, some folk don't feel it's for them, and I think, you know, we've got a a job to do to make sure that people do know it is theirs, it's for them, it's partly owned by the council. Um, We want to make sure that we maximise the use of that. Um, And of course, you know, we will want to work with partners um, about uh, about water safety um, because there are a number of people now who are playing an increasingly important role in taking people onto the water. And so the council, you know, isn't the only actor in this particular drama. Um, There are a number of organisations who do that and and do it very seriously and do it very well. And we want to make sure that we work with them as well. Jackie asks, how will the council work with communities for action on climate change, trees and plastics? Will the promises about the environment be backed by timetables and budgets? It will be. I mean, we just um, issued the council's uh, budget for 21-22. And of course, part and parcel of that is a commitment to our uh, climate action plans um, and our tree plan. Um, the council is issuing annual uh, action plans on climate change. So we have not one of these councils just declare a climate emergency and then do nothing. 
Um, you know, we don't have wish lists. What we've got is clear plans to uh, that we can act on. Um, and we're looking to ourselves uh, in one plan, you know, getting our own house in order, our buildings and our fleets, um, but also, of course, what we can do to help the rest of the city face up to the climate emergency. And, of course, residents need to be involved. And if you look at the plans, you'll see that we're already thinking about ways in which we can get residents on board with waste and recycling, bring on energy improvements, and how we get around the city. We'll be starting this later in the year. Um, you know, we can't just lay down the law to people and tell them they've got to change because it won't be as easy for some as it will be for others. That's why these plans work. They bring in the infrastructure and the facilities to make the change that little bit easier for people in the long run. So we've deliberately focused on funded deliverable actions, not loads of new strategies and endless conversations narrating the climate change problem. We all know it's urgent. What we need to do is get on with it. And so um, every action in our climate change uh, plan um, and the climate emergency action plan is funded and deliverable by December 2021. But we recognise that we need to ratchet up the actions if we achieve net zero uh, by 2030. In order to do that, the government must change its policy positions on energy generation, transport and housing in particular, because that's where most of the carbon comes from. Um, so we want to do more on local energy and local generation and solar and all that. But until you know, the national grid is not capable of taking a huge new intervention in local energy generation. So the government has to has to compel the national grid to do that in housing. Well, we've got a huge. Uh, program of solar installation on our new bills, but where we really need to do some hard work is on, particularly in the private rented sector, particularly in the inner city, the older housing. That's where a lot of the energy loss is, a lot of the carbon uh, is generated, and we need to do something about that. Alison asks, will you do anything to improve parking? Some streets have no room for emergency services to get through and cars are having to park on pavements, which makes it unsafe for pedestrians. Some of our neighbourhoods were built before any of us could afford a car. I mean, you look at all the post-war stuff north of the Crown Hill Road. You know, most of that was designed when hardly anybody in Plymouth owned a private car. Um, and as we've been doing regeneration, some, you know, we've been able to integrate more private parking into the new developments. But it's a long, you know, it's a long old struggle, is this? Um, you know, um, and, and of course, a lot of households have more than one car, and the space is in the road. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not unique here, but you know, if I can park in my own street, I'd be doing quite well around there in Pebble, um, because there's simply more more cars than, than there are spaces in the street. Uh, but look, if people are parking illegally, it is difficult because we're waiting for powers from the government to stop more pavement parking. You know, it's uh, the police got some, some limited powers and so have we, but it's very few and far between. But we can patrol and we can deter. So, um, you know, people are um, parking uh, and, and, and it causes danger. They can serve notices on these cars. So please report them. Uh, you can report them on our council website, plymouth.gov.uk. Um, and if you go to the parking and travel section, you can report parking issues there. Craig asks, the traffic going through the Barbican at peak times can be unpleasant. Are there any plans to pedestrianise Southside Street at busy times, but still allowing for deliveries? <laughs> it's really difficult, is this, because um, we haven't got any plans. Um, because this issue does come up from time to time. Um, and half the traders in the Barbican want it, and half don't. Uh, so we're damned if we do and damned if we don't. Um, we closed the road on a temporary basis to resurface the whole of the Barbican in, 20, in, in the whole of South Street in 2019. I don't know whether anybody remembers. We had all manner of complaints about the road being closed. Um, so if uh, if we had that road just for a temporary closure to resurface the road, imagine what it would be, be like if we closed it for, for recreational purposes. There's also issues around where do the buses go, where do the taxis go, and there's all other practical things. Now, I'm not saying, you know, um, we, we won't look at it in the future, but there are no plans to do it at the moment. 